Hi, morning everyone. Uh, I'm Martin Brideson, the president of the Clay Math Institute. Uh, so I hope those of you who are here for a week are having a great week of mathematics. Uh, special welcome to those of you who are just here for the day. Uh, so today is, is the, the mathematical highlight of, of the year for the CMI. Uh, it's going to be a, a great day of mathematics. I think there are like four fantastic talks. I don't want to keep you from it, so I'm just going to once more welcome, and I'll hand you over to Mike Hopkins, who's going to introduce the first speaker. Well, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing Oscar Randall Williams to you. When I looked at his brief bio on the program sheet, I was kind of astonished to realize he only received his PhD, his DPhil, 10 years ago. I feel like he's been a big part of the scene in uh, the study of manifolds uh, forever. <laughs> but um, anyway, Oscar received his uh, DPhil in 2009 under the direction of Ulrika Tillman. And he's now a reader at Cambridge, and he's been the recipient of the Whitehead Prize and the Leverhulme Lever uh, Award. And um, as I said, he works on, on the, the, uh, the theory of manifolds. And I just want to take a moment and, and set a little bit of the stage for it and then hand the floor over to Oscar. But, uh, so the big breakthroughs in understanding manifolds sort of probably started in the late 50s and early 60s with the famous work of Milner and Curvair introducing the technique of surgery and, and connecting algebraic topology to the study of manifolds. And that led over, over many years and over many ruminations on what we mean by the study of manifolds in aggregate to a classification in some sense, but as a classification of manifolds as the dimension went off to infinity. So it's kind of a stable classification. And the next kind of big breakthrough uh, came in the, probably in the late 90s with the work of uh, Ulrika Tillman and Eve Madsen, and then Eve Madsen and Michael Weiss, where the, um, the, the moduli space of surfaces as the genus goes to infinity was understood, and a famous problem of Mumford was solved. Uh, and so that opened a whole bunch of new techniques, and that's around the time, or a few years later, when Oscar came on the scene and his famous work with Soren, where they studied the diffeomorphism groups of connected sums of products of spheres. And, um, and again, they proved famous results now in a given dimension, but as the manifold goes off to infinity, it gets bigger and bigger. And in recent years, there's been some really dramatic improvements uh, with, uh, with Oscar and, and Soren Gladius and Sander Coopers and others, where they've understood there's been dramatic progress in understanding what happens as you come back from the stable range. And we're now in a position almost of being able to understand the diffeomorphism groups of just almost any given manifold. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, and there's a lot of dramatic new progress in this field, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it from Oscar. So. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mike, for the introduction and, uh, <coughs> and for giving away about 60% of my talk. Um, <coughs> so as, as Mike said, I, I want to... Oh, I didn't try this. Yes. <coughs> I want to explain some methods that topologists have come up with in the last... Uh, well, fairly recently, in the last, let's say, 20 years, for dealing with certain moduli spaces uh, but I first need to explain to you what sort of moduli spaces I have in mind. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be very idiosyncratic what I consider to be the sort of things we can study versus the things we can't. For example, I'm not going to mention anything from the point of view of algebraic geometry, which is where moduli spaces maybe first came from. Uh, so you might feel upset by that. But let me try to tell you what I mean by moduli spaces. And, and the motivating example is the first original and best moduli space, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. So what does that mean? That means we take... We fix a genus of surface, let's say it's at least two, and we look at the set of all genus G Riemann surfaces uh, up to isomorphism. And to begin with, that's just a set. Uh, we would like to make this into some sort of space, and there's various points of view on how to do that. Uh, you can make it into a topological space, you can make it into an algebraic variety. Uh, I want to explain a sort of uh, differential geometric point of view on how to make a, this into a space, which is due to Erlen Eels. <coughs> and they say you do the following thing. You pick a platonic genus G surface that you're going to make reference to the whole time. And you look at the, the space of complex structures on that given topological or smooth, let's say, surface. 
Uh, and if, uh, if that's all you do, then what you haven't really made a moduli space of surfaces. You've made a space of complex structures on a fixed surface. Really, you would like to now forget the fixed surface. And you do that by taking the quotient by the symmetries of the fixed surface, namely the group of diffeomorphisms uh, of the, the genus G surface. So, so diff plus, so orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, let's say. <coughs> Uh, and there's one point here, so uh, you have to take some sort of slightly intelligent quotient. Uh, depending on which mathematical culture you come from, you might call that the stack theoretic quotient or the Orbifold quotient or the homotopy quotient or something. Uh, and that's that just to deal with the fact that the diffeomorphism group doesn't quite act freely on this space, so you need to be a little, a little cagey about that. <coughs> uh, and then one can form that quotient in two steps. One can first divide out by the action of diffeomorphisms which are isotopic to the identity. Uh, and then one can divide out by what's left. Uh, so you can take the space of complex structures modulo diffeomorphisms that are isotopic to the identity, and it turns out there you can take a, a naive quotient. So there the action is free, and you don't have to worry about these uh, orbifold or stack theoretic issues. Uh, and then you quotient out by the everything else. Uh, and of course, if I have a topological group and I take the quotient by the identity components of that topological group, that's a discrete group. Uh, and these two things have names. The complex structures modulo diffeomorphisms isotopic to the identity is what's known as Teichmodder space, uh, and the residual discrete group is what's known as the mapping class group. It's called gamma G. It's the mapping class group of the genus G surface. And the mapping class group doesn't know anything about complex structures. That's just a smooth topological object. <coughs> um, so, there's, so there's three descriptions, or two descriptions, if you take one of them as being a definition. There's the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. I can write it as complex structures modulo diffeomorphisms, or I can write it as, and diffeomorphisms there is a topological group, or I can write it as Teichmodder space modulo the mapping class group. Uh, and uh, there's now two facts, one not so difficult and one rather difficult, that the space of complex structures and Teichmodder space are both contractible spaces. Uh, for the space of complex structures, that's not so difficult. So a complex structure on a manifold is determined by the induced almost complex structure on its tangent bundle. And in the case of surfaces, in fact, that's a bijection. So giving a complex structure is the same as giving a, on a manifold, on a surface, is the same as giving one on its vector bundle, and that's a linear algebraic thing. And if I have an oriented two-dimensional vector space, the space of complex structures on that is the same as the space of inner products on that, and that's contractible. So, so that's not so difficult. And then the more difficult statement is that type model space is contractible. Uh, which is true, it's in fact it's homeomorphic to a Euclidean space of dimension 6 g minus 6, but all I want to say for now is that it's contractible. Um, so we've got these three descriptions, and two of them are of the form a contractible space modulo a group action. And I need to give you a very brief reminder on what we call classifying spaces in algebraic topology, which is exactly formalizing this construction. If I have a group, maybe topological, then the classifying space of G, denoted BG, is any contractible G space, with a free G action, modulo the, modu modulo the group. Okay? And the power in this idea is that you're allowed to pick any contractible free G space. So BG is not a particular space. It's an idea that you can model in many ways by picking different contractible G spaces as suits your taste. <coughs> uh, and let me point out two things about this. If, if G is a discrete group, then we've taken a contractible space modulo a discrete group, and so the contractible space is the universal cover of that BG, and so the space is the so-called einerbohm maclean space. It just has one homotopy group, which is the fundamental group, and that is the group that you started with. So by doing this construction, one has lost no information about the group. You can recover the group you started with from this classifying space by taking the fundamental group. And taking classifying spaces is how we like to input groups into homotopy theory. You take the classifying space of the group, and then you're working with a space, and that's recorded all the information about the group. Uh, and a further point is that, yeah, the, the homology of this space is exactly the same as the group homology of the group. Uh, and if, if G is a topological group, then you, uh, you can't recover G sort of up to isomorphism as topological groups, uh, but you can recover uh, it in the next best sense. You can certainly recover the space G, and it's, you can recover the group structure in a certain sense that I won't try to explain, and you do that by sort of categorifying what it means to take the fundamental group. You don't take loops in the space up to homotopy, you just take the space of all loops in the space. That's a space in its own right. It's some sort of group because you can concatenate loops, and in an appropriate sense, it's equivalent to the group you started with. 
So again, in, in an appropriate sense, you don't lose information by taking the classifying space of a topological group. Um, <coughs> and so there's, a, so there's these three descriptions of the same thing. The modelized space of Riemann surfaces as some set theoretic thing whose points are Riemann surfaces up to isomorphism. That's equivalent to the classifying space of the mapping class group, which is a discrete group. And that's also equivalent to the classifying space of the group of diffeomorphisms of that manifold, which is a topological group. And the reason studying Riemann surfaces is so interesting is that these are just three different worlds that happen to intersect at this very miraculous point. You can study MG from the point of view of algebraic geometry, which is where it's mainly studied, but I won't say anything at all about. You can study it from the point of view of combinatorial group theory. The mapping class group has well-known presentations, and you can think about uh, any sort of questions from that point of view. Or you can study it from the point of view of differential topology, which is sort of my side, uh, by thinking about the actual space of diffeomorphisms of a, of a surface. <coughs> um, <coughs> so my definition for now of a modular space is anything that's like any of these. Okay? And I want to give you some examples, and hopefully everyone will have something on this list that they care about. So, so, for example, you could take a very similar thing, which is a modular space of principally polarized abelian varieties, AG. That's very similar in spirit. Another thing that's very similar in spirit is the space of configurations of endpoints in the Euclidean space. So a point in this space is a mathematical object, namely a subset of the Euclidean space, and moving in this space means deforming that object. It's a sort of modular space in the most uh, classical sense. Another thing is Hurwitz spaces, which parameterized <coughs> branch G Galois covers of the line or something. Those are things that are roughly speaking like MG. So points in the space have a meaning, they're some sort of mathematical object. Then there's things that are like the classifying space of the mapping class group, which are classifying spaces of all sorts of other families of groups that you know, like symmetric groups or braid groups or general linear groups over some ring or symplectic groups or maybe orthogonal groups over some ring or automorphism groups of free groups. And all of these things have the property that they're automorphisms of some other mathematical structure like finite sets, modules, free groups, something like that. Um, <coughs> and uh, the reason we call classifying spaces classifying spaces is because they classify things, which is precisely what modular spaces are supposed to do. So I allow these in my list. And then you have things like, uh, like classifying spaces of diffeomorphism <coughs> groups, which are of surfaces. For example, classifying spaces of diffeomorphism groups of anything else, or variants of that, like maybe homeomorphism groups, or groups of homotopy equivalences, or things of that nature. Um, so all of these things are uh, sort of modular spaces in the sense that I'm happy to think about. Um, <coughs> and I want to make a case, don't look at that yet, I want to make a case for, uh, in particular, the classifying spaces of diffeomorphism groups as being a moduli space in the sense that you would first thought of if you hadn't been to the first few minutes of this talk, which is a space whose points are some mathematical uh, objects of some mathematical structure. And to do that, I use that I can, uh, there's a, I can choose what I mean by BDIF by picking a particular contractible free diff space. And the one I choose is the following. I pick a manifold, and I look at the space of embeddings, smooth embeddings of that manifold into an infinite dimensional Euclidean space. <coughs> That's some space. It has an action of the group of diffeomorphisms by precomposition. If I have one embedding and a diffeomorphism, I get another embedding. Of course, the embedding has the same image, but it's a different embedding. Right? The, the, the map is different. Um, and it's also contractible. The fact that it's contractible is a sort of uh, fancification of Whitney's embedding theorem. Whitney's embedding theorem says it's non-empty. And somebody once told me that if you have a very good proof that a space is non-empty, you will automatically prove it's contractible. <laughs> <coughs> and and Whitney's, uh, Whitney's argument is good enough in that sense. <coughs> um, so I can use this as my model for a free contractible G space. Uh, and what does that mean? So, so I take embeddings, modulo the action by precomposition of diffeomorphisms. But if I have two embeddings that differ by, uh, by precomposition, the only information left is the image. If I have two embeddings with the same image, then by definition they differ by diffeomorphism, namely do one and do the inverse of the other one. So this set, the quotient actual set is the set of subsets of Euclidean space, which one are smooth manifolds, and two are diffeomorphic to the smooth manifold I had in mind, W, let's say. Okay? So this is a modular space, I would say, in the, in the sort of most naive sense. It's a set of mathematical structures, namely submanifolds of R infinity, which are diffeomorphic to W. And moving around in this space means exactly what you would think it would mean. You sort of deform the manifold a bit, and it's stretch it and bend it and so on, but you don't change its diffeomorphism type. And it's incredibly, this is not just propaganda. 
Everything I know how to prove about classifying spaces of diffeomorphism groups uses precisely this point of view. You, you make sort of point set theoretic arguments in this model. Um, <coughs> Uh, so as I said, so why cohomology of moduli spaces in particular, which is the title of the talk? Why not, for example, homotopy groups in moduli spaces? Well, cohomology has a distinguished uh, meaning in this game because a moduli space means something that classifies some families of mathematical objects. So, it's, uh, so maps from B to M should be families of whatever mathematical structure you're thinking about over B. But then by Yoneda's lemma, cohomology of M has a meaning. It's exactly characteristic classes of that kind of family. It's all ways of assigning to every family of whatever's over B a cohomology class in B in a way that's natural under base change. So that's why cohomology of moduli space is the correct thing to consider. And you might think of other topological invariants in moduli spaces along the way, but my point of view is that that's somehow the, the goal. <coughs> uh, OK, so I want to explain three tools um, today of uh, how we prove things about moduli spaces of manifolds, like the one I just talked about, but other things as well. Uh, and the first one is known as homological stability. And it starts from the fact that you will have noticed almost all of my moduli spaces had some parameter, n or genus or something like that. And if you're careful, you can see that all of these moduli spaces of a given type, like symmetric groups, let's say, have maps between them. If I have a permutation of n minus 1 points, I can get a permutation of n points by fixing the, the new point. right? If I have an automorphism of a module of rank n minus 1, I can get an automorphism of a free module of rank n by doing the trivial automorphism on the new factor. If I have an automorphism of a free group of rank n minus 1, I can take free product with the identity map of the integers, and I get an automorphism of the new one. Um, for surfaces, it's a little fiddly, and I have to, tr I have to do a small swindle, uh, which is I need to make a new definition. I want to think about surfaces that have a boundary. Uh, so... so just like I had a platonic genus G surface, I have a platonic genus G surface with one boundary. And I'm going to do exactly the same game. I look at diffeomorphisms of that surface, which are the identity near the boundary. Uh, and I do the same thing. I divide out by the ones that are isotopic to the identity. And what remains is a discrete group, gamma G, comma 1. So that's G, G comma 1 means genus G, comma 1 boundary. Um, no other number of boundaries will arise, but the notation is so standard that I couldn't help myself. Uh, and the advantage of having a boundary is that now I can compare surfaces of different genus, right? If I've got a diffeomorphism of a genus G minus 1 surface, I can adjoin a little genus 1 surface and take the identity diffeomorphism on that. And then any diffeomorphism I had here extends by the identity, and it extends validly because I insisted that diffeomorphisms were already the identity on the boundary. So when I glue on this identity bit, they, they match and they give me a well-defined diffeomorphism. So now I can compare mapping class groups of different genus as well. <coughs> uh, and the, the generic theorem that happens in this business is that you have some sequence of groups, uh, G0, G1, G2, and so on. And uh, on group homology, uh, the maps become or tend to become isomorphisms as you fix homological degree and you let the index go to infinity. Uh, and typically, it tends to happen in exactly the following way. There's some function f that tends to infinity with n. And what you discover is that the maps that compare rank n minus 1 with rank n are epimorphisms up to an including degree fn, and they're isomorphisms in degrees strictly smaller than that. That's what tends to happen. And uh, technically, it's convenient to repackage this as saying that the relative homology uh, vanishes up to degree fn and including fn. Okay? So there's a long exact sequence that goes that, that relative homology and comes from behind, and so this map being surjective or isomorphism is the same as the relative object vanishing. <laughs> uh, and this happens for all the groups that I've mentioned so far. Uh, so for the symmetric groups, this property happens. It's due to Nakaoka in the 60s. For general linear groups uh, over rings that are not absurd, uh, it also happens. Uh, for symplectic and orthogonal groups over many rings as well. Uh, for automorphism groups of free groups. Uh, and uh, in this business, there's sort of two things you can do. Uh, you can think of a new family of groups and prove that it has homological stability. Uh, or you can also uh, sort of try to finesse the function f. And that's why there tend to be many people in this list, lists because the function has been finessed in sort of several ways over the years. Uh, and the one that's most relevant for what I'm saying today is the mapping class group. It's due to Hera originally, and then the, the, the range has been finessed by various people. 
which is the, the, the relative homology of genus G mapping class group relative to genus G minus 1, vanishes for degrees less than, this is the function f in that case, 2G minus 2 over 3. And uh, yeah, so, so the, the contributions of these various people were improving this range from one third to a half and then to two thirds eventually. <coughs> um, and just to connect my uh, surfaces with boundary to surfaces without boundary, it's also the case that the map that takes a surface with boundary and fills the boundary in, that also is actually an isomorphism on homology in a range of degrees. So anything I calculate about surfaces with boundary also applies to surfaces without boundary in some range. But it's very technically convenient to have boundaries available. <coughs> um, and so I want to explain a little bit about what the idea of this is. The, the idea is to use somehow to Quillen, and it's not a particular argument. It's a sort of, um, I don't know, perspective or sort of principle that you can try to tweak and apply to various situations. Uh, but this is how one way of saying it is you, you find a simplicial thing. That might be a simplicial complex, or I prefer simplicial sets or semi-simplicial sets or something. So what does that mean? It means I've got a set of zero simplices, a set of one simplices, a set of two simplices, and so on. And I remember how the one simplices, a one simplex has two ends, and I remember what they are. And a two simplex has three faces, and I remember what they are, and so on. Uh, and you find one that has an action of your group GN. And you try to arrange the following three properties. You try to arrange that all the stabilizers of that action are also groups GM, but for strictly smaller m. Uh, you try to arrange that this simplicial object ideally would be contractible because then the quotient of it by the group would be a model for the classifying space of the group. Uh, typically that won't happen and you have to settle for being somehow approximately contractible, i.e. being highly connected, having most of its homotopy group zero or many of its homotopy group zero. Uh, and the third property is very difficult to make precise, but let me just say that the actual quotient is not too crazy. Typically, we arrange that by saying that the action is transitive on a set of simplices of each dimension. That would be not too complicated, for example. It would have one simplex of each dimension. <coughs> uh, and in this situation, here's a philosophical reason for why this stability holds. Property, which one is it? Two says the, the intelligent quotient of xn by gn is an approximation to the intelligent quotient of a point by gn, and that's the classifying space of gn. On the other hand, by part one, the, the intelligent quotient is built up out of the stabilizers of the various simplices, and those are all strictly smaller groups in my family. And by part three, the instructions that tell you how to glue together those various stabilizers are not too complicated. And you can imagine in this situation, you can prove something about the homology of GN relative to the homology of the smaller ones, okay? And what you can prove is, tends to be this homological stability. But there's various ways of implementing this, and I, I don't want to be too... Uh, dogmatic about the correct way to do it. <coughs> uh, but Natalie Wan and I did axiomatize one dogmatic way to do it, which does every single step of this argument. It provides for you, apart from the step that everybody has always known is the most difficult step, which is this step two. You have to show that this thing is, is a good approximation to a point, i.e. is highly connected. And that always has some specific, uh, you have to think specifically about what family of groups you're thinking about. And if you're doing finite sets, you'll make one argument. If you're doing mapping class groups, it's very different. And there's some principles for how you might do that, but there aren't sort of general theorems that say all groups of this kind you can do the following for. So there's always some art to doing that. <coughs> and I want to give you some flavor of like the thing you actually have to do to prove such a theorem is actually prove one of these spaces is highly connected. So let me tell you what that looks like for symmetric groups. For symmetric groups, here is the correct choice to take. It's the so-called complex of injective words. It's a simplicial object whose p simplices are words of length p plus 1 in the alphabet 1 up to n, where each letter occurs at most one time. So injective words, so words that are not, not injective. <coughs> um, and that has an action of the symmetric group by permuting the letters, of course. Uh, and uh, a word of length p plus 1, the faces of that simplex are all the subwords you get by eliminating some letters. Um, and uh, let me do some examples. So, so here's so just this side. This is injective words on an alphabet of two letters. So there's two words of length 1, namely 1 and 2. But there's two words of length 2, namely 2, 1 and 1, 2. Okay? And you look at this space and you immediately convince yourself that this space is connected. Uh, which turns out to be the, what you need. The connected is highly connected for small values of highly. <coughs> uh, 
Um, if you take uh, injective words of length three, then there's three words of length one, there's six words of length two, and there's six words of length three. And then what you're going to be required to show is that this is simply connected. Okay? And if you took a very rigorous course in the fundamental group, as I did at this university, then you will know how to do that using something like Cypher Van Kampen or something and wor working at a presentation for the fundamental group and doing some Tietze moves to, to trivialize it. Uh, but of course, that's not going to generalize to higher dimensions. So to prove the general statement, what happens is that this space Xn is always n minus 2 connected. Uh, and then you have to come up with some more systematic way of dealing with things. This has been proved by many people in many different ways. Uh, I won't say anything more about that. But this is the sort of thing you have to actually deal with at the end of the day. It's some combinatorial thing that's completely specific to the kind of groups you're talking about. <coughs> and it seems like the strategy I explained is somehow very much about groups. And indeed, for a very long time, people only thought about homological stability for families of groups. But if you interpret it correctly, here's, and here's what I mean by correctly, suppose I take the intelligent quotient of the GN action on everything, then that is, I want to say, a sort of non-abelian resolution of the space BGN. So in topology, I mean, in spaces, you can't take the difference of two maps between one space to another. So you can't make sense of, like, the chain complex because you want to write down alternating sums of face maps. And we can't do that, so we work with simplicial objects instead. Uh, but this is some sort of non-abelian version of a resolution of BGN. It's not an actual resolution because this space XN wasn't actually contractible, but it's some sort of approximate resolution good enough in a range of degrees. And when you take this point of view, you realize that you can replace all of these things by, uh, I mean, they don't have to be of the form set modulo a group. You can just axiomatize this sort of setup. Uh, and from that point of view, many, many uh, moduli spaces in the sense I described fit into this picture. So you can make non-abelian resolutions in moduli spaces by smaller moduli spaces, and you can make many of the same sort of arguments. <coughs> and... Uh, so on Galatius and I did uh, a version of this, which is what uh, Mike Hopkins mentioned. So if you have a simply connected manifold of dimension 2n, and 2n should be at least 6, uh, and it has non-empty boundary for the same reason that I wanted surfaces to have non-empty boundary, so I have a potential way of comparing ones of different uh, genus, uh, then I, if I look at the diffeomorphism group of W when I've added g copies of Sn times Sn, uh, relative to the one where I've only added g minus 1 copies of Sn times Sn, then you get this property. You get vanishing homology, which is just a reformulation of homological stability. And here W can be any manifold. It should be simply connected. Um, but this has been generalized by many people. Uh, for example, these days you don't need simply connected. You can have virtually polycyclic fundamental group. Um, you can stabilize by things other than Sn times Sn, for example, products of spheres or spheres cross disk or things like that. You can do homeomorphisms instead of diffeomorphisms and things like that. Uh, and quite interestingly, you can also study the diffeomorphism group not as a topological group, but as a discrete group. And that also has exactly the same property. What the homology is is very different, but the phenomenon of it stabilizing turns out to be the same. <coughs> um, so that's one part of the story, is showing that many of, you know, it sounded like you had a very infinitary problem. You had all this whole family of moduli spaces, and each of them have infinitely many homology groups. But in fact, many of those groups are the same. Uh, and uh, once you know the homology stabilizes, then you'll sort of feel tempted to ask what it is. And uh, I just want to point out that, in fact, these are completely different problems, and the methods are completely different, and they're also logically completely different. There are many examples of things that we know stabilize and have no idea what the limit is. But if you have a sequence of spaces, it doesn't matter if it stabilizes or not. You can always take the limit. Limits in category theory are not the same as limits in analysis, right? You, everything has a limit. You just don't know what it is. <coughs> um, and the techniques that we use are completely different as well. And the technique that one uses to work out what the stable homology uh, might be uh, has a very different source, sort of. Namely, it comes from the foundations of, of algebraic K theory uh, as defined by Quillen. Um, and I want to explain a little bit about that. <coughs> and the first idea is to combine all your moduli spaces into a single mathematical object in the easiest possible way, namely disjoint union. Uh, and the point is, is that when you do that, you have more structure. All of these objects have some sort of multiplication. If I have a permutation of a set of size M and a permutation of a set of size M, I can take disjoint union of those sets and I get a new permutation. If I have an automorphism of two free modules, I can take direct sum of them and I get a, a, a new one. And same with configuration spaces, I can put them next to each other. 
with, with surfaces, I can... I, I talked about gluing on a genus 1 surface to a genus whatever surface, but of course you can glue on any, to any surface to any other one. So when I combine these into one object, it becomes a, a monoid. I have a, an operation. Um, it's definitely not a group again. Okay? The set of path components of all of these things are the natural numbers, and the multiplicative structure corresponds to sum of natural numbers, which is not a group, uh, but it's a monoid. Um, and uh, I want to point out... <coughs> Uh, I want to point out that um, <coughs> I, I mentioned to you that classifying spaces don't forget information about the group. If I have a group, even a topological group, and I take its classifying space, I can take the space of loops on that space, and that recovers the group up to, up to homotopy equivalence, at least. But I can also take the classifying space of a monoid. I can take the classifying space of a monoid, and then I can take the loop space of that. And that's meant to be like a group, but I started with a monoid. And this is the homotopy theorist version of group completion. You start with a monoid, and you produce something that's like a group out of it. Uh, and I, you will accept when I tell you that that is the homotopy theorist version of group completion, but maybe you say, what does it have to do with group completion in the sense of inverting elements, for example? And what it has to do is what's known as the group completion theorem, which says that if you have a little bit of commutativity around, let's say the thing was homotopy commutative, then the homology of loops of the classifying space of the monoid is obtained from the homology of the monoid, by localizing the set of path components, i.e. inverting the thing that wasn't invertible in the first place. <coughs> um, <coughs> uh, so an extreme example of that maybe is if, if, if my monoid has, like all these do, exactly the natural numbers as a set of path components, then to localize the natural numbers, I just have to invert one thing, namely the number one. So I can make that localization as a, as a direct limit. And in that case, it, I find that the the direct limit of the homology of the spaces involved is the homology of this, of this homotopical group completion. Uh, I should just take one path component of that. Generally, it will have many path components, so I just pick one of them. And it's crucial that this is a homological result. Okay? The homotopy groups of Xn and of loops Bm uh, will have very little to do to each other. Okay? It's fundamentally a homological result. <coughs> and let me tell you some group completions that we know. So there's a thing about Pretty, Quillen, Siegel, May, um, <coughs> suppose I take configurations of endpoints in Euclidean space, that's a monoid under disjoint union of configurations, and I take its homotopical group completion, it turns out the result is a space that homotopy theory is called loops k, sk, so it's the space of pointed maps from a k-sphere to itself. Pi zero of that is the space of homotopy classes of maps from sk to sk. We know they're classified by their degree, which is an integer, so the, fun so the, the set of path components is the integers, which is the group completion of the natural numbers, but it's some higher homotopical version of that. Uh, if I do the same thing with symmetric groups, uh, the answer turns out to be the space that homotopy theorists call loops infinity of the sphere spectrum. Uh, what that means is it's the stabilization of loops k, s, k as k goes to infinity. And the fact that these are somewhat similar is not surprising because uh, one model, the symmetric group, is a diffeomorphism group. It's a group of diffeomorphisms of a compact zero manifold a.k.a. a finite set. And my description I gave of classifying spaces of diffeomorphism groups applies perfectly well there. I can take embeddings of a finite set into R infinity, modulo the symmetric group action. So the configurations of endpoints in R infinity is a model for the classifying space of the symmetric group. Uh, and indeed, this is obtained just as the direct limit of these as, as k goes to infinity. <coughs> uh, in this group completion business, you don't always have the right... I mean, it's not always going to be the case that the group completion is some space that you already know. Like, what does it mean to identify the group completion? It means you already know a list of spaces that exist, and you tell me which one it is. That typically won't happen, uh, and indeed, Quillen's definition, or one of Quillen's many definitions of higher algebraic K-theory, is as the group completion of the monoid uh, that comes from automorphisms of free modules over the ring. So in that case, it's just a new space that has no other or no previous incarnation in mathematics. And there's no answer to what is the group completion. That is what, a, new, a new object. <coughs> uh, and a remarkable theorem uh, that Mike uh, Hopkins also mentioned um, is that uh, in the case of surfaces, Madsen and Weiss did identify what the homotopical group completion was. And it was something that already existed, crucially. I won't explain what this notation means, but given that it has a complicated name, you can believe that it's some sequence of constructions in algebraic topology that starts with the group SO2 and does something and does something. Uh, but, um, <coughs> but the point is it, it's a thing that exists. 
And it's built iteratively by basic constructions in algebraic topology, like taking classifying spaces, taking tom spaces, taking loop spaces. And all of these, I mean, algebraic topologists have spent 50 years working out how to study the homology of all of these, uh, all of these <coughs> operations, what they do to homology. Um, so it's very easy to compute the homology of that, uh, certainly with rational coefficients. Uh, here's the answer. It turns out that rationally, it's a polynomial ring on a countable sequence of generators. They're known as the Millen, Rita, Mumford classes um, in, in all even degrees. Uh, it's also known with, with finite field coefficients, but the answer is very complicated due to Song Galatius. I won't say anything about that. Um, but putting everything I've said together so, f so far together, that tells you what the cohomology of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces is in, in some stable range that depends on the genus. It is this polynomial ring on these, on these classes, kappa. Uh, and I'll just point out, they're, yeah, they're called Millen, Rita, Mumford classes. They also were known, I mean, before. They're, they're not a consequence of the calculation. In fact, everybody, uh, it was well known that this injects into this. And the, the remarkable thing about Mazen and Weiss theorem is that there's no more classes that people hadn't already thought about. Um, the more important point is that it's not just a calculation of the rational cohomology. It's a space level statement that you can then extract things like rational cohomology or homotopy or, or things like that from sort of relatively easily and internally to algebraic topology. <coughs> um, so there's, uh, there's several proofs of Dittmas and Weiss theorem now that somehow take slightly different points of view. Um, all of them are from the point of view of, of differential topology. None of them are from the point of view of algebraic geometry, which is where this question of Mumford about what the cohomology of MG is started. Uh, and all of them take specifically this, this embedded manifold sort of model as, as like the working space. Um, <coughs> the most well-developed of them uh, is, so th the proof due to Galatius, Madsen, Tillman, Weiss, and then the sort of extension of it, or sort of variant of it that Song Galatius and myself gave, starts with this remarkable theorem of Ulrika Tillman uh, that says that there's a relationship between the homotopical group completion of these mapping class group monoids uh, and Kabordism categories from topological sort of conformal field theory. Uh, and I want to give a, a one-slide overview of the proof of this Madsen Weiss theorem, the, the, the later generation proof. Um, here's the first thing you do. The first thing you do is you make it a question not about compact surfaces, but about non-compact surfaces. You make a space of surfaces in R cross an infinite dimensional cube, so the non-compact space, R cross an infinite dimensional cube. Uh, and crucially, I mean, they're, they're allowed to be non-compact surfaces, and al things are allowed to move to infinity, and conversely, to come in from infinity. Okay, so, so like the diffeomorphism type of the surface is not locally constant on this space. P compact pieces of the surface can flow along to infinity and fall off, and consequently you must also be able to bring things on. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a small elaboration. Maybe you equip your long surface with some of these walls that I've drawn here that cut the surface up transversely, um, but, uh, and those walls can sort of come and go in this topology. In, this, incidentally, is a model for the classifying space of the, of the two-dimensional cobordism category from, from quantum field theory. <coughs> and the first thing you do is you identify this with uh, the, the D-loop of the space that showed up in the madsen weiss theorem. So a space such that when you take loops of it, you get the space that showed up in the madsen weiss theorem. And this is fundamentally what's known as an H-principle in the sense of Gromov. Uh, one way of proving it is using Gromov's H-principle in a certain incarnation. Um, there's other more manual ways to prove it, which is somehow philosophically proving an H-principle in a way that hadn't really been thought about before. But the fundamental point is that you're dealing with non-compact things. The point of this H-principle business is, is all about non-compact manifolds. You try to show that some sort of approximation to the object you're studying uh, is equivalent to the actual object you're studying. And the way you do that is you try to deform it so that it's more and more equivalent to it. And every time you get stuck, you throw the thing that's annoying you off the end of the manifold to infinity. So it's fundamentally about non-compact manifolds. Whenever there's some difficulty, you say, ah, well, the thing's non-compact, I can push it off the edge, and then that problem's gone away. And it's about, you know, you have to do that in a very coherent way because you might get stuck very many times, and you have to make sure that they don't affect each other and so on. But, but uh, <coughs> uh, so this is one step, and this is proved by Galatius, Mass, and Tillman Weiss. Um, uh, and it identifies then the homotopy type of B cob with, with this space. Uh, the second thing is that this is some space of all surfaces, 
like disconnected surfaces, ones with sort of, if you think about the surfaces being the thing between these two walls, surfaces with many boundary components and so on, we just wanted connected surfaces with one boundary component. Uh, and so somehow we've got, to, we've got too many things here. We've got too many surfaces and they're glued together in all possible ways. I only allowed this very particular gluing of two surfaces next to each other. Uh, and so what you do is you make a model for the classifying space of this monoid, which this is my cartoon picture of it. Let me s speak you through it. It's non-compact surfaces still. Uh, they have to contain this orange strip that's infinitely long. Uh, they have to not contain any compact pieces. And all of these walls which I asked to be there, they have to intersect them in precisely one circle. Precisely one. Um, <clears throat> and it's not very difficult to show that this sort of thing is a model for, for the classifying space of this monoid. And then, of course, all you have to do is show that the space of these things is the same as the space of all surfaces. And that's the fourth step. Of course, the fourth step is really sort of 80% of what you actually have to do. Uh, but you have to, I mean, you take a family like that and you have to think of ways to deform it in order to make it into a manifold like this. And you have to do it not for one manifold at a time, but you have to do it over the whole space of manifolds. So you have to do it coherently. And this is known as maybe parameterized surgery. And this is sort of incredibly important that these are manifolds inside some space where you can manipulate them by dragging pieces around and, and so on. Um, but th so this is somehow the, the thing you have to do. You have to show how to modify a very general type of family of manifolds into a very specific type of family of manifolds. <coughs> Uh, so the argument, as I described it, was originally uh, used by Soren Galatius, um, uh, not for manifolds, but for spaces of graphs inside Euclidean space. So, so one-dimensional cell complexes. Uh, that was known to be a model for the classifying space for the automorphism group of a free group. Like the free group is a fundamental group of a graph, and so symmetries of graphs are somehow related to symmetries of free groups. Uh, and using that, he, he went through the same sort of process I described. I mean, he did it before we did our thing together. And the answer he gets is, uh, is again, the, the infinite loop space of the sphere spectrum. It's precisely the same answer that I had up a few slides ago for symmetric groups. And the very surprising conclusion is that in some stable range, the, the map from the symmetric group to the automorphism group of a free group that just permutes the generators uh, is a homology isomorphism even though one of them is a finite group and one of them is definitely not. And unstably, this is definitely not true. For each n, there's some homology groups that are different, but they're very high dimensional compared with n. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the scheme that I outlined in this sort of proof, Son Glaciers and I worked out how to make this work in all even dimensions. Uh, there's many complications there. I mean, the scheme is the same, but the surgery you have to do is more complicated because there's many manifolds. For example, we don't have a class classification of surfaces like we do for surfaces. Um, <coughs> and the general formulation is quite complicated, but let me give you one, uh, one uh, baby case of that, which is what happens if, you, if W is a disk. So if the manifold you start with is a disk uh, and you stabilize it by connect summing with Sn times Sn, that's the higher dimensional analog of a genus G surface with one boundary. If N is one, that is a genus G surface with one boundary. And the answer is formally very similar. It's given by it's the cohomology of some infinite loop space of some spectrum. And if you go ahead and calculate it, you see you get a polynomial ring on some symbols called kappa C. And there's some conditions about what C is allowed to mean here. It's meant to be a monomial in some known polynomial ring with some degree constraints. But it's a very similar flavor answer. Um, I just want to point out that uh, there is an answer for any simply connected manifold. It's just. I, you know, if you give me a manifold, I have to sit down and calculate a bit, and then I tell you what the answer is. But the, the method applies to all simply connected manifolds. It's quite difficult to give a formulation that um, would be palatable to maybe this audience. <coughs> um, um, can, sorry, can we go back to Yep. If n is 3... If n is 3, yep. So that list is empty, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, <coughs> so, uh, so what comes after this? So we have these stabilization maps between different moduli spaces of the same kind of object, but of increasing complexities. Uh, there are these methods to show that these maps tend to be isomorphisms on homology if you go far enough along. There are methods I've tried to explain to compute what the limiting homology is. Um, 
But uh, that sounds like some sort of first order approximation to something. Uh, so what comes after that? Uh, so I'd like to tell you about uh, a result that I proved with Song Glaciers and with Alexander Cooper's. Let me remind you of what homological stability for mapping class groups said. It said that the homology, the relative homology, genus G relative to genus G minus 1, vanishes for degrees up to 2G minus 2 over 3. Uh, and we proved the following thing. Um, these relative homology groups have new maps between them that change genus and change homological degree. And those maps also are isomorphisms in a stable range of degrees, in a bigger stable range than when both groups are zero, incidentally. Otherwise, there wouldn't be much content. So, so they vanish up to a slope two-thirds, but we get this new phenomenon up to slope three-quarters. So the slogan I like to say here is that somehow these relative homology groups measure the failure of homological stability. But these failures of homological stability have their own kind of stability in a different direction. Okay? This direction, I mean, notice here, it, it, the indices matter quite a lot here. The, the homological degree is different in the source and target. It's not like ordinary homological stability where you compare deep homology of that with deep homology of that. The, de the degree changes, and the genus goes up by three. Uh, and a little addendum, if you work rationally, then you can change all these three quarters to, to four fifths. It's a little better. <coughs> um, so here's a picture of what that means. This is a, a, a chart of the relative homology groups. Uh, you, all these empty points down here are the fact that they vanished below slope two-thirds. Um, and this wedge is the region where the new result applies. It says there's a stabilization map parallel to these arrows. And uh, stabilization maps that end in that region are always subjective. And stabilization maps, roughly speaking, that start in that region are always injective as well. So there's a new pattern along that line. And we also compute some of the groups, like the ones exactly on this line turn out to be Q in every degree in the maps of isomorphism. And all these red question marks are groups we can show are not zero um, using this method. We show some group far over there. I think it's in genus 19 is not zero. But all the maps to it were subjective. So all the previous things have to be non-zero as well. Um, and uh, let me try to explain in the remaining time uh, the idea behind this, it uses uh, a new method in this, uh, in this sort of area um, based on ideas from abstract homotopy theory. Uh, so we have a paper, it's called Cellular EK Algebras. I'll explain a little bit what that means. Uh, and the idea, the basic idea is the following. I, I already convinced you that it's a good idea to combine modular spaces into a single mathematical object, which is a monoid. And the group completion of that was the thing that computed stable homology. Uh, and a monoid, of course, is a, some sort of algebraic structure. And the idea is to take very seriously that that is an algebraic object of the sort that you could ask, can I find a presentation for this algebraic object? Now, uh, everything here, B gamma, right, wasn't really a particular space. It was any space that you make by this sort of construction. This, this is not a particular point set thing. It's some sort of homotopy type. And space, if I've got a space that's homotopy equivalent to a monoid, it needn't be a monoid. So you need to work with some more robust notion of algebraic structure, a homotopy invariant notion of algebraic structure, in order to make sense of this question. Uh, so this is, as I say, this is higher algebraic, if you like. So it's algebra in some homotopy theoretic context. Uh, and the, the correct notion of algebraic structure turns out to be what's called an EK algebra. Uh, I just want to say very briefly what that is. As soon as you start working homotopically, many things that you're used to as being properties are no longer properties, they're structure. Right? If I have a group, it may or may not be an abelian group, but it's a yes-no question. If I have a, a, a topological space that has some sort of multiplication on it, what does it mean to say it's abelian? It means that I prove to you that A dot B is homotopic to B dot A. But to tell you it's abelian, I have to give you that homotopy. I could just promise you it exists, but that's not a very useful thing to do. So, so to, to prove that it's homotopy commutative, the only way to do that is to, to give you a homotopy. And then you come up with a situation that a group can be abelian for more than one reason. Because I might give you one homotopy and somebody else might give you another. And they might be essentially different homotopies. They both prove it's homotopy commutative, but in different ways. Uh, and uh, EK algebras, uh, there's a hierarchy between associative and the most commutative thing you can think of. It's called E-infinity. 
And in homotopy theory, there's a hierarchy between those, which is about how much information is this homotopy that proves things are commutative supposed to have. Uh, and it turns out that all of the things that I talked about, all of these things that I wrote as digital union of a modular space, they all have some amount of commutativity. The one for mapping class groups turned out to be E2, which is the smallest amount of commutativity above associative. And essentially, all the other examples I mentioned turned out to be E infinity, which is the most glorious form of commutativity available. <coughs> um, and so uh, it's quite important that even I, I, but the theorem said there is a, there is a map that induces an isomorphism on homology. Uh, even defining what that map is requires this sort of thinking. Uh, if I ask somebody who's thought a little bit about these things, maybe I'll pick on Benson, to produce a secondary stabilization map, after a few minutes he would write one down uh, and it would be wrong. It would be, uh, it would be in a very precise way, in a very precise way, it would be 10 times the correct map, literally 10. Uh, and the reason is there's a, there's a way of dividing the map Benson thought of by 10, but you can only do that division by thinking in this higher algebraic way. <coughs> Yeah, so that's wrong, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, uh, and another thing I want to point out, I said I wanted to make a presentation for this object. So in other words, I want like generators, relations, and so on. In homotopy theory, generators and relations are not different things. Generators and relations are all examples of attaching a cell to a space. And if you attach it trivially, maybe you think of it as being some generator. And if you attach it non-trivially to something, maybe you think of it as enforcing a relation. But they're not really different things. They're just <coughs> cells. So in other words, my program is to analyze this object R, um, analyze a cell structure for it in the land of, of E2 algebras. And in fact, I want, to think of, I want to remember the fact that it's graded by genus, in the land of natural numbers graded E2 algebras. Um, and yes, this paper that we wrote is some sort of foundational way of thinking about these sort of things, putting together many things that were in some form or other known in homotopy theory, but weren't put together in a way that was especially uh, useful for studying these particular problems. But let me tell you how an argument in this subject would sort of go. The first thing to do is to reverse engineer what a cell structure of R must look like in low degrees by knowing what its homology is. And luckily, many, many people uh, have computed homology of mapping class groups and many details about how homology of mapping class groups behaves. And this is a table of that. So this is uh, genus and homological degree. And the fact that along the rows, what you get is eventually constant is just homological stability. Uh, uh, and yeah, so these are some things. This 10 is the 10 that's causing Benson so much difficulty. <coughs> um, uh, and, and so the first thing we do is we, we make a little cell complex in this land of E2 algebras uh, that, f that faithfully reproduces this. So it's not, it's not R itself, it's just some abstract thing that we've made, but it, it produces the correct homology. Uh, and we, there's many things, it, it, knowing the homology groups is not enough for this. You need to know how all sorts of homology operations act and multiplications in this region and brackets and so on, but all these people have done very many calculations and so we can put things together to do that. Uh, and the, the one we make has five cells. It has one there, one there, two there, and one there. Uh, and on this little five-cell complex in this world of E2 algebras, uh, you can formulate homological stability, and you can formulate secondary homological stability, so this sort of theorem. Uh, and you can prove it essentially by direct calculation. The thing only has five cells. You can just compute what everything is, and you can observe that this secondary stabilization map is indeed an isomorphism. It's just an observation in this small example, which is not the thing that we're thinking about. It's just some small model for it. Uh, and uh, step two is to show that you can obtain the true answer from this small model by only doing very safe things. So what you have to do, you have to start with a small model, and then you have to attach cells whose dimension is at least three, that's reasonable because I already made all the first and second homology be right. So you, you shouldn't have to attach any cells down there. And, but the important thing is that the dimension is strictly bigger than the genus. So in other words, in large genus, you never need to attach small dimensional cells. Uh, and if you think about this inequalities, then you see that the, the lowest slope uh, d, over g, uh, d over g that you might get is when d is 3 and g is 4. So there's a 4-3 cell that you need to attach, or you may need to attach, of course. This is only some sort of estimate on what the cells are. 
Uh, and this uh, three quarters turns out if you have homological stability or secondary homological stability in a range of slope three quarters, then attaching cells of slope above three quarters can't break that. So what you show, I mean, it changes what the homology is, but it doesn't change the property of stabilizing or having secondary stability or so on. Uh, and so, okay, so that's the second step. So, so you need to show that it has this property. And to do that, we use uh, so what, exactly what you would do in, in algebraic topology. If you had some space and you know it's homology, and maybe you also know it's simply connected, so there's not some crazy fundamental group issues, you can reverse engineer a cell structure from looking at the homology. Right, whenever you see a Z in the homology, you need to attach a cell. And whenever you see a Z mod N, you need to attach a cell to make the Z and another cell to make the mod N. And, uh, and you do that by, by using the fact that hom singular homology is the same as cellular homology. And there's a homology theory for these EK algebras that has many names, EK homology derived into decomposables, or it's been about four minutes since I mentioned Quillen, uh, topological Quillen homology. <coughs> uh, well, this is general. In this example, it's K is two, yes. Um, uh, which reminds me that, yes, okay. <coughs> um, and this homology theory faithfully detects cell structures. So if you can show that the homology vanishes in some range, then you can build a cellular object with no cells in that range. Uh, and so that's what you do. You prove it vanishes in this range, the E2 homology of this object. And this is constructed, I mean, that homology theory is a very abstract thing constructed using Quillen theory of model categories and its derived functors of indecomposables. That's not something, you can, that perspective you can't sort of use to compute things with. You can use it to define things with. Um, but we use... Uh, a different perspective that you can compute this by an iterated bar construction. In fact, perhaps a paper with Ezra Gester's with John Jones is maybe the first place that that showed up. <coughs> um, and so that's a very down to earth perspective that you can use to actually calculate with. And what it comes down to is very similar to what it came down to in homological stability the first time around is there some simplicial complexes the theory provides to you and it asks you to show that these are highly connected. Uh, and it's difficult to convey so they're not the same sort of simplicial complexes that show up the first time around. They're different in flavor. Let me just say that, okay? I mean, you can, but it's again simplicial complexes. So it's again combinatorial arguments about simplices and so on that you have to actually do. In this case, they're simplicial complexes whose, whose vertices are arcs on a surface and they have to split the, they have to definitely split the surface up into pieces and whose higher simplices are tuples of arcs on the surface. And you have to prove these are highly connected. Um, in the last minute, let me just say that this perspective uh, applies to many, many examples. It's not just this mapping class group uh, example that this comes to. You can apply it to many things. And indeed, for many examples you think of, you discover that somebody has done a lot of the work for you already. Um, for example, if you try to apply it to general linear groups, you discover that Ruth Charney has already proved that the vanishing line for the homology, for EK homology. Not in that language, because I'm confident she probably doesn't know what EK homology is, and it was also a long time ago, it was in the 70s, but the complex that turns out you need to study is one that she just invented and studied in one of her early papers. And similarly, if you study symplectic groups, you discover that Loyenka and van der Kaden have already provided you this complex, and it's highly connected. And if you study AUTFN, you discover that Hatch and Volkman have already studied this complex. It's the complex of free factorizations of a, of a free group. And so the vanishing lines, in all these examples, you can just look up. And that implies a little bit. That implies ordinary homology stability with a line of slope one half. But if you want to go anywhere beyond that, you have to do the analog of analyzing this little cell complex. You have to look what happens in low degrees, look up calculations people have done, and see what you can get out of it. Um, and, uh, and phenomena that you can discover in that little cell complex will tend to propagate by this vanishing line for cells. So the fact that this little complex happened to have secondary stability says that the whole thing has to have it because it's obtained in some sort of upper triangular way from that, which can't break this property. And I'll just finish with one last little example. Uh, we also applied this to, to general linear groups over finite fields. So Quillen, in his calculation of algebraic K theory of a finite field, he computed the homology of general linear groups over finite fields when the coefficients are co-primed to the characteristic of the field. Uh, and he also showed that when the, when the coefficients are, are of the characteristic of the field, 
the stable, he, did, he couldn't compute what the homology groups are for each general linear group, and in fact, we still don't know them, but the stable homology is zero. Uh, and using these sort of methods, we're able to, uh, it doesn't look especially impressive, but it's somehow the, the content is in what exact bound we get here for the vanishing of general linear groups. Um, so Quillen probably got this without the n, uh, which was good enough for what he wanted to do. Uh, and similarly, for, it turns out that the, pri the field F2 is different from all other finite fields, and you get a, you get a different answer of slope two-thirds, and it's essentially different. I mean, it does not, it's not that we couldn't prove that, it's, that it's, it's probably not true. Um, and yeah, so there's many other examples one could try to apply this theory to, which I encourage people to think about and send me examples of moduli spaces that they care about. Thank you very much for your attention.